Welcome to another episode of Questions with L.A. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, and I will try to answer your questions to the best of my ability. Sometimes I get stumped, and um, that's okay. Anyway, we'll get into this and so much more, but first, a word from our trusted sponsor. Low levels of collagen show up in more ways than one. Although saggy skin and wrinkles are the most common that come to mind, did you know that your nails, hair, and joints can also be signs of low collagen levels as well? One of the quickest ways to help combat low levels of collagen is to supplement with a high quality collagen supplement. And there may not be a better choice than going to healthwithla.com, healthwithla.com, which uses five critically important types of collagen to help provide your skin, hair, nails, and joints the nutrients you need. Look the best this coming spring summer session for 51% off, plus receive several free bonuses, including VIP health coaching for life. Before their half-off sale ends by going to www.healthwithla.com, that's www.healthwithla.com, or simply click more at the bottom of this video in the description box and the link in the description. The best part is you have over 60 days to change your mind if you aren't fully satisfied. Folks, order now and thank me later. I drink it every day and I am glad I do. I have noticed a difference. Uh, this is from Lisa. Hey, LA, I recently saw an article claiming that the mark of the beast is actually 616, not 666. I've never heard of this before. I'm curious if you know anything about this claim. Thank you for your faithful service to our Lord and Savior, your sister in Christ, Lisa. The important thing to remember here is not, and I've heard this before too, that the people say, well, it's really not 666, it's something else. The thing to remember is this. The dragon, the dragon's man, the Antichrist, is the guy who sets up this system. Now remember, this is something really interesting. 2,000 years ago, when John was, was penning this, people would look at this and go, well, this is impossible. How can this ever happen? Go back 200 years ago. And well, how can, how can they put a mark on somebody? That's, it's got to be allegory. It, it can't possibly be real. But now we're living in a window where this technology is here. Okay, the technology is here to actually implement something like this. Has it been implemented? No. The Antichrist, the son of perdition, okay, the seed of the dragon will implement this system. In my opinion, it doesn't matter what the name adds up to, although whether it's 666 or 616 or other numbers that I've heard, the important thing to know is this. We are living in a window of time where the technology is here to fulfill that prophecy written 2,000 years ago, and that should wake people up. So the thing to look for is when they start to implement this, that you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade without that mark. Isn't that interesting? This is from Susan. <clears throat> hey, I love your show and appreciate all the research you've done. Well, thank you, Susan. My question is, has anyone ever tried forensic facial reconstruction on any of the elongated skulls? Uh, Susan, if you go to our website, lamarzilli.net, and, and download the DNA, <clears throat> which is number um, six, on the uh, on the greatest hit parade, if if you go and you doubt and you watch that DVD, you will see facial reconstructions of what these things look like. But that's again, it's an artist's conception. We really don't understand what they look like. There are some very interesting specimens that I've seen in the museums in Peru. Uh, Tim Alberino took us, Chase Klotsky and myself, uh, to this one museum in Lima. Um, and the, the skull was incredibly elongated and some of the facial features were still intact. So, yes, uh, Mar Marcia Moore has done some of that. If you Google her name, you can find that and go from there. Okay, let's continue. Hey, LA, 25 years ago, and this is from Mike. 25 years ago, I was flying from Seattle to San Francisco at 8 a.m. on Christmas morning on Alaska Airlines. Since it was an early morning flight on Christmas Day, I was the only passenger on the plane. Wow, that, that's pretty cool. Over North California, I spotted a silver metallic sphere floating outside my airplane window. It's hard to say exactly how far away it was, but my guess was about the size of a VW bug. I stared at it for a good five minutes plus. Its surface wasn't smooth. It appeared to have what I can only describe as a conduit or machinery of some sort on the outside. It was very eerie. It never moved, just floated there as we flew by it. This was in 97, so I didn't have a cell phone with me, so no camera. 
I pressed the call button to get the flight attendant and asked her to look out the window to see what I was seeing, just to validate it, since there wasn't anyone else sitting near me. She just snickered and said, well, maybe it's Santa Claus. <laughs> snarky, snarky. That makes me think she already saw it as well and may have been told not to acknowledge it. So she continued, or Mike continues, I wound up dating an Alaska Airlines flight attendant years later. I told her the story and asked her if she'd ever heard of this sort of thing. She said no, <clears throat> but did tell me that a pilot once told her that airline pilots have a cold word for UFOs when notifying air traffic control that they've spotted one. They call them Santa Claus. Hmm. So in my opinion, these balloons are nothing new with their man-made or extraterrestrial. The government is just now telling us about it and acting as if, as, as, if, as if it's a new thing. I think they're lying, of course, but why? So the question is, <clears throat> but why? It's a managed agenda. We talked about this this week, Mike. It is a managed agenda. They're rolling this out incredibly slowly. Um, it's all about the threat. That's how they're couching this. Uh, advanced ATIP, Advanced Aeronautical Threat Identification Program, headed by Luis Elizondo. And we'll get into Luis in a little bit because someone asked a question about that. The bottom line is, in the 90s, airplane uh, flight attendants, airplane pilots did not talk about this. You could lose your job um, because they would go, well, maybe there's something wrong with you if you saw a UFO. So the whole, the whole idea behind the UFO phenomena was squash it. Quash it, quash it, quash it. Keep it down. You didn't see anything. Do you really want to report it? And this is why a lot of airline pilots never even go on the record, never report what they've seen. So it's, it's very interesting. What we're seeing is this cat and mouse game. If you look at our UFO film, the first one in the series, UFO Disclosure of a 70-Year-Old Cover-Up Exposed, we sit down with Paul McGuire, great researcher, great author, and Paul, I asked him, Paul, when do you think this closure will begin? And he said, he said, basically, 2017, not later than 2017. Now, McGuire doesn't have a crystal ball, and, and he can't see the future like I can't see the future. But we know, and, and, and Paul says on the record, by 2017, December 2017, Tucker Carlson, Commander David Frey was on, talking about what? The UFO phenomenon. That the tic-tac-shaped object that he saw over the Pacific Ocean was, in his opinion, real and not from this earth. Moving right along, this is from Belinda. A lot of people believe the first book of Enoch should be part of our Bible. I believe it is a good historical reference, but because Enoch basically says towards the end of the book that he's the Messiah, I have a major issue with it. Is there another way to translate this that might say something else? Um, the bottom line is Enoch 1, okay? Enoch 1 which talks about the fallen angels leaving their first estate, coming down to earth, grabbing the women, making that pact on Mount Hermon. That's our book, Counter Move. That's why we get into it. How the Nephilim returned after the flood. It's a suicide pact. They know what's going to happen. They do it anyway. Okay? When Jesus dies on the cross, his body is there, but his spirit and his soul descend to the lower parts of the earth, Tartarus. And there he proclaims, according to Bullinger's paper, and I agree with him, it's a proclamation. He's not preaching the gospel. It's a proclamation. No jailbreak. You're not getting out. You are going to be in this dungeon until you're released at the very end of the age. So I look at the book of Enoch. Uh, I appreciate its historicity. As I've said numerous times, I do not count it part of our canon. However, I will say this. Enoch 1, if you were going to keep one book out of the biblical prophetic narrative, that's the book you would keep out. Hope that answers your question. Um, this is from George. Hey, LA. I <clears throat> hope all is well with you and Peggy. Thank you. As a spirit-filled musician who's played music almost as long as you have and was in worship bands for about 20 years uh, be before I became really interested in Nephilim. I've since become extremely interested in how musical frequencies affect the spiritual realm, specifically after I heard your friend Steve Quayle tell his Siri on how the shofars were used at the Battle of Jericho to take down the walls. <clears throat> something's going on at the Battle of Jericho. Whether the shofar actually brought down the walls or that was a signal and the Lord just went like this. He stopped holding things together because he does hold all things together. We don't know. 
He claimed that since the city was a Nephilim city built on their theories of construction that are no longer available to us, that Yahweh used the unique frequency of the shofar to loosen the foundations of that wall. The reason I'm asking this question is I'm convinced that the shofar is far from being just a symbolic ancient tool. And I want the Christian community to be equipped to know how to use it against the demonic realm to its full effect. This may be a stretch, but I would be very curious to see how it affects the cryptic creatures of the world like Bigfoot. Your thoughts? So, um, yeah, this is my take on this, George. The technology that built the walls at Jericho and perhaps other megalithic sites, specifically Saksi Vermont, that technology may in fact be pre-flood. Uh, Tim Alberino and I, we were down there with the Gen 6 team, along with Steve Quayle. Um, Tim and I believe that what we're looking at here is pre-flood. We never see this duplicated anywhere else. We see similar stuff, similar construction, but not like the the megalithic designs that we see in Saxe Romain and Oye Tintambo, and also Machu Picchu. It's there for a period of time, and it just kind of all goes away. And then we get into the megalithic age where we see huge menhirs, standing stones, but it's not it's not the same as Saxe Romain. We see dolmens um, and places like Zambujaro in Portugal where we were, the huge stones that are that are part of these these ancient crypts, but not not joined together like we see at Saxe Roman. So the bottom line is this, that everything has a frequency. Everything. Everything in this universe has a frequency. It's vibrating. Sound seems to hold things together. We know that from, from the word it says this, that he is before all things, Jesus. He is before all things, and he holds all things together, which is incredible. Right? He holds, Jesus holds all things together. Now, I don't know how he does that. That's why he's God. But the bottom line to me is this, that sound may play a very important part in what we're looking at. And, and I've seen this. There were, when we were at the Kansas City Revival last year, um, Hope in the Heartland, and there was a storm that was rolling in. We were tracking it on our cell phones. There was a storm that was rolling in, and a, a group of people had three or four shofars. They went out into the field, looked at the storm, blew the shofars, and commanded it to go away. We watched, we watched the storm shift and move away from us. I'm not making that up. So, you know, things happen. Um, when I was in Newark, Ohio, at uh, the first time in, in probably um, centuries, that anyone had connected the, the mounds in Ohio with the Nephilim and the fallen angels, okay? <clears throat> and we went to get something to eat, came out of the church, and looked up at the sky, and it was a scallop sky, and it was going green. And I looked at my the people I was with, and I said, this looks like a tornado sky. And we went into Newark. The church was on the outskir outskirts of Newark, Ohio. Newark, Ohio. Parked at Chipotle's right across the street from the Great Circle Mount. And I'm looking at this dark, menacing cloud coming in. It looked like something out of uh, Ghostbusters. I mean, it was that ominous. And you could see <clears throat> cells coming down, tornado cells coming down from this black, ominous cloud. I stood up in the parking lot, raised my hands, and at the top of my lungs, the wind's howling and this whole thing, at the top of my lungs, in the name of Jesus, the Lord rebuke you. The storm turned and went in another direction, and then the tornadoes fell upon another town. Interesting. Did I have something to do with it? I know I didn't, but I think he did. Let's move on. Uh, this is from Shirley. Hello, Brother Marzilli. I just finished watching your Monday, February 13th, 2023 video. Regarding a recent rash of unidentified objects shot down in various locations, you brought up many good points. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, especially the fact that these occurrences are being publicized regularly by all public news media instead of being kept secretive. You're right. That makes no sense. I live in Tawa City, Michigan, approximately four miles from the bay in Lake Huron. My husband and I were actually headed toward the area from church on Sunday. So she continues, and she took... These pictures, she wants to uh, thank us for the, the work that we do. And I will send you, I'll show you this photograph. Not much to look at here, 
but you can see right there, there's an object right there. I'll, I'll hold it here so you can, you can check that out. Not sure what we're looking at, not sure what she saw. Um, that is very interesting. Looking at it here, there's definitely something going on in the water. Uh, I wish it was a little clearer and not so fuzzy, but that's what we have. Um, we also know from the pilots, some of the pilots who have come on the record stated, and, and this audio, by the way, was released a couple of days ago. We covered some of it, I think, on Wednesday's show, yesterday's show. We covered a little bit of it, but we really don't know what's going on. It's being kept for the American public. Even, even Senator John Kennedy basically said, you know, lock your doors tonight. Well, that's not going to stop an entity that can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy from coming into your home. But I get what he's saying. Something is going on. Even Senator Kennedy doesn't know. So here we have an elected official, as I said yesterday, and he's left in the dark, no pun intended. So I don't know what we're looking at. This is part of the coming great deception, in my opinion. This is from Heidi. Hi there, Ellie. I just wanted to submit a question for you. I have often wondered in the Garden of Eden, animals must have talked, and Adam and Eve could talk and understand them. The reason I think this is in Genesis, Eve does not seem scared or frightened that the serpent is talking to her. So let me just stop you right there, Heidi. In our book, um, in my book, I should say, Counter Move, Have a Nephilim Returned After the Flood, this is precisely what, what I state, that Eve is not taken aback by the serpent talking to her. She's, I mean, she's not going, oh my God, it's a talking snake and running out of the room, not doing that. She's conversing with, with the snake, with the serpent, with the dragon, essentially. Did the other animals talk? I believe that they did. And after the fall, everything changes, everything changes. So I wrote about this in, in Counter Move, how the Nephilim returned after the flood. Um, but I agree with you that uh, the animals, and don't ask me how this works, I don't know. But she's not, Eve is not taken aback by the talking serpent. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, this is from Stacy. What has happened to Luis Elizondo? I searched on Google, but can't find anything on him since 2022. He was on everything for months, and now he has lockjaw. Really good question. Um, not sure what's going on with Mr. Elizondo. I know that we were supposed to speak at a conference together, and that was blown out of the water. So I'm not sure what's going on with him. I have no communication with him. I've never met the man. I have followed his work. I find it interesting the way he insists that these, the phenomenon is not demonic. I, I completely differ with his assessment on that. Um, and we have this, LA, what do you think of the article on Ralph Glidden? So I looked at the, or I tried to, tried the link, Tom, and, and did not find it. Do you still have the photo of Ralph with the six foot diameter skull? Um, it's, it's very interesting. This is the one that had the bottom cut off that showed the skull when you revisited the museum. Um, he goes on from there. The article, the link that the article um, did not work, okay? So I, I'm not sure what you're referring, but yes, I have the photograph, which is in my book, On the Trail of a Nephilim. Um, we broke that story. That's, that's my research, my investigative reporting, flying out to Canaline Island in the archives with John Borregina. Borregina asked me, he was a curator, a former curator of the museum, what do you want to see? I said, I want to see the photographs. Out came museum boxes with folders. In those folders were several pictures. All of the pictures made it into my book, On the Trail of a Nephilim, Volume 1, I believe. And uh, there's a nine-footer, which is that Ralph Gooden recently exhumed. Now, there was also a hit piece done on Ralph, Richard Shaw, the late Richard Shaw, my former colleague and, and director of the Watchers series. And I flew back out to, actually, we took a boat out to Catalina. And we were there, and we walked into the museum. And there's, there's the picture, which I had discovered, okay, that was in the archives, tucked away in a manila envelope never to see the light of day again, except they cropped the giant out of the picture. So, of course, we filmed that, and that went viral for us as well. That's the way the game is played. Um, L.A., somewhat long-term fan of yours. Well, thank you. This is from Gordon. Appreciate your work. Uh, I am enjoying your latest four-part series. I have followed off and on the UFO thing since high school, class of 63. 
A couple of years ago, I was visiting a fellow believer when he happened to mention having seen a UFO when he was 10 years of age, 1985. I asked him details, and then of all the things he saw um, about 92 and 93 after the first incident. What is interesting is they obviously were intentionally wanting to be observed. So, um, the question would be, you know, why, why is this happening? Why do, do some craft appear and then linger? And that's a really good question. And I don't have the answer to that, actually. The phenomenon is, is very complex. Nobody's got all the answers. I certainly don't. But I do agree with you that sometimes they appear and they want to be seen. In our very first film of the Watchers series, we showed a clip of this, this guy called Prophet Yahweh, who allegedly could call down UFOs. And in, in the film clip, um, you can actually see it, uh, watch, the very first Watchers, where he's out there and he's doing his thing. And sure enough, a UFO appears. So we know that, that some people are able to, to do this. Um, there's, there's a guy, I won't mention his name, but he does this regularly. He calls them down and um, he's got uh, internet fame, shall we say. Um, this is from Zach. Hello, I'm a half-breed native person from Southern California. I live 15 minutes from Hollywood and I'm fully owned by Jesus, my Messiah. Uh, I had a mental breakdown after I was pursued by this hooded thing and lost everything. I had witnessed one UFO over my Awanis group at my church as a kid. My family is medicine on the Hooper Reservation. My question is, could the Black Knight satellite be the New Jerusalem? Uh, basically, and this is from Zach, I would say absolutely not. That is not the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles um, in height. The question is, and I know when I say this, some people get all riled up, is it a cube or a pyramid? And we don't know. I lean towards pyramid, but 1,500 miles wide, okay, is certainly a lot larger than the so-called Black Knight satellite that's out there. This is from Ian. Uh, you're probably not going to read this LA. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm from Whitestone, Queens. I've had some weird stuff happen to me after my brother died in 2015. It happens on my parking lot. I kid you not, I'm not crazy. Lights, bugs, animals, little fireballs in the sky and, where the and in the cemetery where, uh, where he is buried. Charles was in my head, but also in my heart. I reached out to Chris Bledsoe Jr. in North Carolina. He actually answered me. We started texting now for years on Facebook. He believes something could be happening to me. Do you believe the people die and come back and somehow connect back to the people that they love? No, I do not believe that. Uh, I do believe that the enemy can counterfeit this. Demons can counterfeit someone. When, when a person holds a seance, right, and a medium brings forth someone, that is a demonic entity posing as the person. I hope that answers your question. Uh, moving right along. Okay, this is from Maggie. Hey, Ellie, I seriously used to compare you to Alex Jones. I thought you were using religion to push your own personal beliefs around without consulting scripture like other conspiracy channels. Then, about a month ago, I gave you the benefit of the doubt. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Maggie. And watch this one of your past videos that came up in my suggestions. I subscribed before the video even ended. I got saved on Resurrection Sunday when I was 12 years old, some 46 years now. I have never ceased to study end time prophecy since then. What got me was that I have always just known that the powers that would be would use an alien agenda as a cover for the rapture of the church. Absolutely. And I just heard you say the same thing on your latest video, Lock Your Doors Tonight. And you said you've been spreading this news for years. Hey, great minds think alike, yes? But seriously, I am so thankful that God had me watch one of your videos. 
I now watch you whenever you put out uh, your daily shows plus something from your library here on YouTube. And she continues, your research and answers to many of the questions that I myself ask are spot on with my own ideas, dogma, and beliefs. Like so few Christian men before you, I truly, truly believe you have been chosen by God to spread this news of coming end time events far and wide. Um, really kind words, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm nothing special. But the Lord has tapped me on the shoulder, and we've been banging this drum literally for decades about the coming great deception. It is coming. The UFOs are real burgeoning and not going away. I say that um, quite frequently now, especially on our Wednesday show, which is, of course, our daily, our weekly update, I should say, on the UFO phenomenon. There's a lot going on last weekend, which is why Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we were kind of covering the whole UFO phenomena. Even that entity that we reported um, when we did the sort of the redirect on the entity that appeared in front of the game trail. That, of course, these people who were hosting a Bible study talking about uh, the so-called aliens and the coming great deception, and that's when this entity appeared. So sort of interesting, right? And thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, Haley, I love what you do and all the knowledge I'm getting from your work. Thank you. Um, this is from Cassie. People like you bring the Bible to life and make our Christian faith more profound. I appreciate that. I came across your video about Fatima last year and was blown away by what you uncovered. I'm Catholic, so this information was very disturbing, although I'm also committed to truth and set about trying to ask other Catholics about it, to no avail. Seems no one wants to go there. I did see a video that Eric from Tradcat Night was on where he talked very briefly about your Fatima video and said he spoke to you and explained or dispelled all the claims you made, which apparently left you speechless. That is utter nonsense, 100% nonsense. Um, I'm, I might have been on the program with him. I don't really remember, but that is absolutely not true. Um, we've created two films on Fatima. I stick by what we discovered and all of our source material is from the handwritten 1917 material from Father Fiera, who was at Fatima, who interviewed um, uh, Lucia, Francisco, Jacinta, and all the other people involved. We also have the un what was at one time the unpublished photograph taken by Joshua Benolio in 1917, specifically on October 13th, the day of the so-called miracle of the sun. We published that. I probably need to redo that book again because every, all the books die, burn in the fire. But what we show in the film, when we sat down with Jose Machado, who um, had access to the archives in Fatima, he handled the original glass plates taken by the photographer Joshua Benolio in 1917. What's incredible about this is that there is a disc-like object directly over the so-called apparition site. I don't have time to get into all of this right now, but suffice it to say that the two films that we have on Fatima, in my opinion, it was a harbinger of deception, strange phenomenon happened, car windshields burst, cars burst into flames, radiation burns on people, there was a flyover. Do the research. He, did, he never left me speechless, and I take umbrage that he would say something like that. And I will certainly debate him anytime, anywhere on the subject of Fatima. Um, let's continue. Last question. This is from Dom. L.A., I've been watching you forever. I'm 76. Here's the question. Do you think there was any connection between the balloon thing uh, and the Kentucky Asbury revival and the revivals that seem to be breaking out? Look, this revival seems to be real. Um, people are getting saved. They're sitting in front and the presence of the Lord is all over that place. I think it's a genuine deal. I'm not there, but I'm leaning on the side that revival has broken out. Hallelujah. So why we have the dragon doing his, his stuff, our God, the living God, the God of the Bible is manifesting. And I find that absolutely incredible. Anyway, folks, that's all the time I have for. If you've got a question, please shoot me an email, questions at lamarzulli.net, questions at lamarzulli.net. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow, Friday, with a very, a very special episode of Supernatural Confrontations.